Now as we turn to God's word, Hebrews chapter 11 says this. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Praise God. Please pray with me. Father, we marvel that you would um, enable us to respond to you in such a way as to bring you pleasure, to please you by faith. So I pray now, Father, for Pastor Trent as he comes and brings your word that you would speak boldly and mightily through him uh, to us, that you would uh, bring faith in our midst to those who may become lacking or those who come weakened or that you would strengthen the faith of those who come trusting in you, Christ. We pray it all in your name. Amen. Please be seated. Some of you might know about the book called A Walk in the Woods by Bill Bryson. Any of you read that book? Others, you might be more familiar with the movie that just came out a couple of years ago, starred Robert Redford. But for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, let me share with you just briefly about it. Uh, a Walk in the Woods is about a man named Bill Bryson who's an author, and he happened to be out one day tramping around his house in New Hampshire when he came across a trailhead for the Appalachian Trail. And for those of you who don't know, the Appalachian Trail is a 2,100-mile, approximately, trail that stretches from Georgia all the way up to Maine. And when Bryson came across this trail, he determined right then and there that he needed to walk it, the entirety of it. So he didn't want to walk it alone. Unfortunately for Bryson, the only person he could possibly think of in the world who might walk this trail with him is an old frenemy of his by the name of Stephen Katz. Now, he and Stephen had had a falling out a number of years before, and they had a long history of annoying each other in the course of journeys together. And so he calls up Katz and invites him to go on this trip, and neither one of them are terribly excited about going with the other, but they don't want to go alone. And so they join up, and they set off on the Appalachian Trail, not having any idea, really, what they were getting into. So as they're making their way along, at some point, Katz runs out of money. He has to leave the trail. He goes and gets a job and starts making money. And Bryson keeps on walking along the trail, but alone at this point. And he finds his experience as he's walking the trail alone to be pretty unfulfilling and unsatisfying. As much as Katz annoys him, there was a certain comfort and appreciation he had walking the trail with someone else. Katz rejoins the trail. They go on hiking along some more, and eventually they quit. They don't finish the trail. So you go into the book thinking they're going to complete the trail because who would write a book about walking a trail that they don't actually complete? But that's exactly the book that he wrote. And it's this funny story about the relationship and the things they encounter together and, and the lessons they learn along the way. And among those lessons are, one, the important thing wasn't that they finished the trail, but that they actually attempted it. A second lesson they learn in the course of the book is that a friend is somebody who no matter how long it's been since you talked, you can still pick up the conversation and go on talking and walking together again. But one of the effects of the book, and I remember when Emily and I first listened to this on a road trip, one of the effects of the book is that it actually inspires you to want to get out on the trail with a friend. 
to go out and take this kind of adventure, to go out and take a walk with a companion, even somebody as imperfect as a guy like Katz was. And when we're reading through Hebrews 11 and we see these portraits of faith, and particularly this portrait of Enoch, one of the effects of it is, is that it's not only to be exemplary for us, but it's, it serves to inspire us, to cause to want us to, to set out on the trail, to, to walk the walk of faith that these great heroes of the faith have walked before us, even imperfect heroes like the ones we discover throughout this chapter. So Enoch gives us a picture of what it looks like to go on this journey, to go on a walk with God. And as we consider what this looks like today, my hope and prayer is that the effect of it is that it it affects you like it has me, that it causes me to want to get out and begin the walk, to set out on the journey into the unknown, walking along with a companion who's none other than God himself. And the question is, how do we get into that kind of a walk? How do we set out on this kind of a journey with this kind of a companion? And so we come to our principle for today in this particular session of our Portraits of Faith series, and this is what we discover. A walk that is pleasing to God is enabled and fueled by faith. A walk that is pleasing to God is enabled and fueled by faith. Now, if you like outlines, here's the outline. The first point is going to be a walk pleasing to God. The second point is going to be is enabled and fueled by faith. And then in the third point, we're going to sort of tie all this together. And I want to share with you 10 marks of a person who is walking with God. So that's where we're going this morning. Let's start with the first piece that a walk that is pleasing to God. If you were to read... um, In Genesis chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 11, as we did this morning, you'd discover this character named Enoch. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us much about Enoch, but what it does tell us is so intriguing that all kinds of legend and myth and superstition developed around this character of Enoch in early Jewish history. And there are books named after him and so on, all kinds of prophecies supposedly about him. Uh, but what the Bible tell us, tells us about Enoch is, is relatively spare, and we're going to focus there. And we discover three facts between Genesis chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 11. The first fact about Enoch we discover is this. Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. If you have your Bible, flip back over with me to the very first book in it, the book of Genesis chapter 5. When you're reading through Genesis 5, this is a chapter that some people have called the and he died chapter. Because over and over, when you read this chapter, you discover this pattern that repeats itself. This is what the pattern sounds like. When so-and-so had lived X number of years, he fathered such and such. And -and so-and-so lived after he fathered such and such, X number of years, and he died. And when you're reading Genesis 5, you see that pattern repeated six times. Fathered so-and-so, he lived such and such, and he died, and he died, and he died. And then we come to the seventh person... Enoch, and the pattern changes. Listen to what the text says, Genesis 5, verse 22. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, Again, if we had read the entirety of Genesis 5 and you see the same pattern over and over and over again, and then suddenly you come to this and no longer does it say, and he fathered so-and-so and he lived, but it says, and he fathered and he walked with God. And it doesn't say, and he died. Instead, it tells us, and he was not, for God took him. This is intended to grab one's attention, and in fact, it does. Enoch was unique in this line because of the walk that he had with God. It doesn't mean that any of these other people in this genealogy didn't have a relationship with God. It means that there was something special about Enoch's intimacy with God that's characterized best by this phrase, he walked with him. Now, One of my absolute favorite things in the world to do is to take walks with Emily. And for the 16 or so years that we've known each other, 
we have taken lots of walks. And as I think back across all of the walks that we've taken, I think about all of the enormous decisions that we've made in the context of just taking a stroll side by side and having conversation together. We've made decisions about the names of each of our three kids. We've made decisions about where we're going to live, where we're going to go to school, what jobs we're going to take. I mean, all of the major decisions in our lives have been made in that context of walking alongside each other. When we lived in St. Louis during seminary, we had a little half mile out and back trail from our house. It wasn't a trail, it was a side road that wasn't particularly interesting. But anytime we needed a break, we needed to connect, we needed to just catch up, share what's on our hearts or minds, confess sins, I mean, anything, it would start with, you want to take a walk? And we would, and we'd go out and we'd walk the trail back and forth, back and forth until we talked ourselves out. Likewise today, we've upgraded from an out and back to a circle but it's about the same distance. And any time we just need to connect and share what's going on, we'll take a walk around the circle. Or if we don't have the kids, we'll go walking on the beach. And invariably, in the course of that walk, we'll talk about the past together. We'll talk about our present. We'll start dreaming about and talking about the future. It's in the context of walking that we share some of our sweetest intimacy together as a couple. And maybe you've experienced that same thing in the context of walks with someone you love. When I, when I, when I think about the phrase, Trent, walked with Emily. That says something to me about, about communication. It says something to me about our, our fellowship we've had. It says something sweet about sharing life together. And so when I read that Enoch walked with God, man, I want that. Don't you want that? Don't you want it to be said of you that you walked with God? You shared that kind of intimacy, that kind of fellowship, that kind of communication where, where you're just going alongside each other, shoulder to shoulder, sharing life, sharing your heart, talking about the past and the present and the future, sharing frustrations, confessing sin, just enjoying one another's company. Enoch enjoyed that kind of fellowship. He walked with God. And you know, what's amazing is that Throughout the scriptures, we're invited, all of us are invited to have that kind of relationship with God. Throughout the scriptures, we hear him calling us over and over, you want to take a walk? You want to, you want to take a walk? And man, I, no matter how long it's been since you've had a conversation with this old friend, I hope today you'll take him up on his offer and say, you know, yeah. I do want to take a walk. Let's, let's go. The invitation is out there for you today. Enoch walked with God. The second fact we learn about Enoch is he was taken up. It's kind of an odd thing to say about somebody, but it's what the Bible says, so that's what we say. Enoch was taken up. If you look back now in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 5, we read that, by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. In other words, Enoch did not go out of this world in the way that every other person in human history has except for one other person. As we're reading through the Old Testament, we discover another person who didn't go out the world to the gate of death like we all do, but this person exited the world in a whirlwind, his name was Elijah. You could read about him in 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah went up in a whirlwind in front of eyewitnesses and, and people saw him go. They knew he went up. In Enoch's case, it was more of a quiet thing. It just, in Genesis, it tells us he just, he wasn't found. He was not. He was, and then he was not because God took him. It was as, in the words of one person, it was as though they had been out walking and God simply said to Enoch, let's not go back to your place tonight why don't you just come home with me? And so he did. And he was not. And this is the kind of fellowship, the kind of intimacy that, that Enoch shared with God such that God simply took him, translated him into glory in a moment. Now the scripture says at the end for those who are alive at the time of Christ's return that we too won't exit the world through death but rather in a moment in the twinkling of an eye will be changed. Enoch got a, got a foretaste of that in some way, somehow, and not exactly like we will at the end, but we don't really have categories for this kind of a thing. Now, Enoch is an example for us. We're told that it's by faith that he was taken up. So you might think that our expectation is, well, if we have faith, then we should also be taken up like Enoch was. But that's not the point of Enoch's example. 
The point of Enoch's example isn't that he was taken up. The point of Enoch's example is what we discovered the third fact about Enoch, which is Enoch pleased God. We read in uh, verse 5, Now before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. As we've been going through chapter 11, we've seen this phrase over and over. People are commended by God for particular things. In fact, one particular thing. And the particular thing that Enoch was commended for is the same thing that Abel was commended for. His faith. Enoch was commended because of his faith. And on account of his faith, in his particular case, he didn't taste death, but instead was simply translated or taken up. Now, you and I can have the same faith that Enoch had, but we may not be taken up in the same way that he was. But just as surely as Enoch did not taste death, so those who have trusted in Christ, though we may die, the sting of death has been removed. So that for us, death is no more harmful ultimately than simply falling asleep. For then we enter into the very presence of God. Enoch was commended because of his faith, and by his faith, he pleased God. Now, for all of us who have put our trust in Christ, though we might not ex ex experience the same kind of translation that Enoch did, we do experience a kind of transferal. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul describes it. He says that, that ultimately through faith in Christ, God has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and here's the word that's related to the one we've just seen, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So while we're not physically taken out of the world as Enoch was, we just as surely and certainly are transferred from having lived in the domain of darkness where Satan rules into the domain of of Jesus under the reign of grace. This is uh, what we experience and what we can experience. Everyone who trusts in him experiences this kind of transferal, transformation right here in the midst of the present time. So a walk that is pleasing to God is a walk of faith, and we are invited to share this walk with God Everyone who believes. Now, there's a second piece to this thing. This, this walk that is pleasing to God, we said in, the, in, our, in our principle for the day, is, is enabled and it is fueled by faith. A walk pleasing to God is enabled and fueled by faith. What's the connection between our faith and a walk pleasing to God? Well, it's enabled and fueled by faith. So as we go on reading into the next verse, what we discover is the author of Hebrews gives us some particular principles that, uh, that apply to the ongoing walk of faith. And here's the first thing we discover. Faith is essential for a life pleasing to God. Faith is essential for a life pleasing to God. In some ways, this is an elementary lesson, but it is fundamental to the walk, the Christian walk. So let's look at verse 7, verse 6. We read, and without faith... It is impossible to please him. As Pastor Todd pointed out last week, the text doesn't tell us, and without faith, it's hard to please God. Or without faith, you might please God. The, the, the scripture says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. The one essential ingredient to a life that is pleasing to God is the kind of trust that takes God at his word Regardless of experience, regardless of cost, regardless of seeming impossibility, faith. Now, some of you, perhaps, like I can slip into at times, maybe going through your Christian life believing or saying to yourself verses that aren't in the Bible, like this one. Without my daily quiet time, it's impossible to please God. Without my good works, it's impossible to please God. Without my church attendance, it's impossible to please God. Without me giving my tithe faithfully, it's impossible to please God. Now, all of these things are important things. The Bible, we are to live according to these ways. But the scripture doesn't say that. It says that the foundational, the fundamental key to a life pleasing to God is that it is rooted in faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Listen to how A.W. Pink puts it. He says, the great thing God required was not attendance on outward ordinances, 
but the diligent seeking unto him by a wholehearted trust. Where faith was missing, nothing could meet his approval. But where faith really existed and was exercised, it would be richly rewarded. The one thing God desires of his people is a wholehearted trust in him, a taking of him at his word without regard to cost, experience, or seeming impossibility. This is the one thing he desires of you. This is the one thing without which all your good works, all your philanthropy, all your thoughtfulness, all your kindness, all of it is meaningless apart from faith and trust in him. Scripture's clear. We cannot offer God in ourselves anything that is ultimately pleasing to him. We're like the kid who's got suit on his fingers and he's trying to straighten out his white shirt. And no matter how much he tries to get that thing straightened out, every time he wipes his hands across it, he just puts more black marks across the thing and the wrinkles then are the least of the problem. Well, so it is that the scripture says in Romans 8 that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We are polluted fountains, the scripture says. We can't produce good water that's pleasing to him. Something has to change in us. Something has to fundamentally happen to us that makes us different than we are. In a word, we must be born again. We have to be changed. It's a work that God does in us. We need him to do this work in us. And the scripture calls us to put our trust in him. Now, having put our trust in God, having been transformed, having been changed by this miraculous work the Holy Spirit does in the lives of his people, now we are accepted by God, not because of anything of our own, but because we're now dressed in the righteousness of Christ. This is a gift God gives to everyone who believes. You see, the person who's living in the flesh is looking to themselves for something to offer to make themselves acceptable to God. But that's not what faith does. Listen to what faith does. Faith looks not to its own self or its own works. It looks outside itself for righteousness. Faith looks to Christ, pleads his worth, his works, his righteousness as its own. This is what over and over the scripture is calling us to, looking away from ourselves and what we have to offer and looking to Christ who was everything perfect for us and who offers to give us the perfect robe of his righteousness so that we might be accepted by God. And now having been accepted by God, he accepts the works we offer to him through Jesus. So there is a faith that is essential to a life pleasing to God. Now, not just faith generally. The second thing we discover here is that there's a particular kind of faith that's essential for a life pleasing to God. There's a particular kind of faith that's essential for a life pleasing to God. And we see it in the rest of verse 6. He goes on and writes that for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So if you desire to draw near to God, if you desire to experience this kind of intimacy and fellowship of walking with God that we've been talking about, there's a particular kind of faith required of you with two components. The first piece is that you must believe that he is. And the second piece is that he's the rewarder of those who seek him. So let's talk about the first piece. You must believe that he is. Well, at some level, this is obvious enough. You're you're never going to seek out to a God that you don't believe actually is there. You must believe fundamentally that God exists. Now, the Bible doesn't actually give us any set of proofs or arguments for God's existence. We don't find that in here. The Bible uh, simply declares it, assumes it. It's all over the place. When the Bible invites us to to draw near to God, it's not inviting us, though, to step into a dark room by faith. The way the Bible speaks of it is it's inviting us to turn on the light switch. 
You see, it's as we, it's as we draw near to God that we're actually stepping into the light. It's, the, it's there that we actually begin to see things as they really are. And so this is the way the scripture presents faith in God. It's, it's to come out of the darkness and to come into the light and see what is plain and evident in creation all around us and evident in the word. But it's not just a vague faith in, we might say, a higher power. It's not just a, a vague faith in, in a God that, that, that everybody around the world worships and acknowledges. It's a faith, the biblical faith is a, is a particular kind of faith and a particular God who has a particular character who makes specific promises that are revealed in this particular book. That's what biblical faith is. And so we put our trust in the God who's revealed in the scriptures and is thought shared in the call to worship who now has spoken to us through his son. He is the object of our faith. Why is it important for us to, 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 to trust in God, to believe in him? You know, some of us have this impression of God that he's, that he's sitting up there wishing people would believe in him so he could feel good about himself and know that he's important because people believe in me. And like, that's what, that's what he's asking for. Boost my ego, help me feel good, believe in me. No, the reason the Bible exhorts us to put our faith in him is because it's, it's faith in Jesus that takes away our sins. It's faith in what Jesus has done that, that transfers us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It's not faith in faith that does that. It's not faith vaguely in, in some unnamed God. It's faith in Jesus. And so this we proclaim. We must believe that he is and that he is the God who's revealed in the scriptures. But there's a second piece as well. We must believe that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. Now, again, it's somewhat obvious. You're not going to seek a God who you believe is going to destroy you the moment you approach him. You're not going to seek a God who you believe is going to cast you out the moment you come. And so the scripture assures us and affirms to us over and over Jeremiah 29, 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. There's a promise for those who are seeking after God. The promise is when you seek him with all your heart, you'll find him, this rewarder of those who seek him. Isaiah 45, I did not speak in secret, the Lord says, in a land of darkness. I didn't say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in vain. In other words, I'm not inviting you to draw near to me and to come take a walk with me only to then disappear and not let you find me. But seek me and you'll find me, the scripture says. What does it mean to seek the Lord? Well, one New Testament scholar, Peter O'Brien, describes it this way. He says, seeking the Lord is a common biblical expression, particularly in the Psalms, to refer to those who firmly rely on God, trust that his promises will be fulfilled, and find in him the source of their deepest satisfaction. To seek the Lord is to, to find in him your deepest satisfaction, to trust that it's his promises that will be fulfilled, to desire him as we sang above everything else. This is what it is to seek the Lord. Now, when we seek him, we're told that he's the rewarder of those who seek him. And God gives a great reward. We're promised eternal life. We're promised the kingdom. We're promised to inherit the earth, that, that all things will be ours. We're going to reign with him and so on. But... That's not the great reward. Again, O'Brien writes, he not only rewards those who ardently seek him, he himself is the reward. It's communion with him, it's fellowship with him, it's the intimacy of walking with him day by day. This is what we discover is the truly blessed life of a Christian. To walk with God, to know him, to share his heart, to hear his heart. To share yours with him. He himself is the reward. The great evangelist George Whitfield in the 18th century, he said this. He said, I've enjoyed more solid pleasure in one moment's communion with my God than I should or could have enjoyed in the ways of sin, though I had continued to have gone on in them for thousands of years. Has not one day in the Lord's courts been better to you than a thousand elsewhere? 
in keeping God's commandments, have you not found a present and very great reward? Brothers and sisters, what he's getting at and what the scripture is getting at is that a short life lived in communion with God is far better than a long life lived apart from him. That, is, that, a, that a life of persecution in communion with God is far better than the safest and most easy, comfortable life without him. That a life in deepest poverty but in communion with God is far richer than, than having all the treasures of this world and yet not having him our great reward. So this is the invitation to everyone who hears the message to come and to walk with him, to share in this intimacy, to share in this fellowship. How do we enter? It's through the door of faith. It's trusting. It's taking him at his word when he says, seek me and you'll find me. Trust in my son and you will have eternal life today and forever. So what does it look like? What does a person look like who is walking with God? I want to share with you 10 marks of a person who is walking in this kind of fellowship with God like Enoch walked. Mark number one, a person who walks with God is reconciled. It's a weird thing to say about somebody, so let me give you, let me just, a, Adam and Eve walked with God in the Garden of Eden, and then they sinned. And they were put out of fellowship. They were put out of communion with God. And what we discover throughout the Bible is that this God who had to put his people out of fellowship with him desires to be reconciled to them, desires so desperately to be reconciled with you that he actually poured out the judgment you deserved on his own son so you could be reconciled to him. But you cannot walk with God unless you've been reconciled to him through faith in Jesus. So with the scriptures, I implore you, be reconciled to God today. Believe that what Jesus has done on the cross is enough for you to have fellowship with God because it is. And trust him. Be reconciled. Walking with God starts with being reconciled through faith in Jesus. People who walk with God, secondly, are surrendered. They are surrendered. In other words, if you're going to walk with God, it, it only goes really one way. You say, where do you want to go today, Lord? <laughs> uh, I'm with you. Uh, you're leading the way. My will is submitted to yours. It's what Jesus said on the cross, not my will, but your will be done. A person who walks with God is a person who's given up their own will, who's given up their own hopes, dreams, desires. It's all, I've given it over to Jesus. I'm, I'm here to walk with you. Wherever you lead, I'm with you. Thirdly, people who are, walk with God are patient. One of the things people discover as they walk with God is that he often operates on a timetable that is completely inconsiderate of your own. Sometimes he moves things way faster than you wish that he would. And you say, why don't you slow this thing down? And sometimes he moves at a pace that's so slow, you say, why don't you speed this thing up? But people who walk with God over time become increasingly patient and they move when he moves and they stop when he stops. And they learn what it means to walk by the Spirit. They're patient. People who walk with God, fourthly, are trusting. You see, when you go out on this adventure with God, we know from the Scripture and the Chronicles of Narnia that he's not safe. He is good, but he's not safe. And where he leads, you don't know. And the fact of the matter is, he will lead you through the valley of the shadow of death. He'll lead you to mountaintops and he'll lead you to valleys. He'll lead you to places where you'd rather not go. And so if you're going to walk with him, you have to trust him. You have to take him at his word regardless of cost, regardless of your own experience, regardless of the seeming impossibility of what he's asking. People who walk with God have, have begun and increasingly are trusting him and following him wherever he leads. Number five, people who walk with God are aware. For these people, they're aware of God's presence and is working in the world all around them. For them, there is no chance. There is no luck. There is no fortune. There's no karma. For them, all is providence. They see around them in, in the seemingly most insignificant details of life, they see the hand of God at work, ordering all things together for good. If you've spent time with somebody, I had the privilege of spending time with a lady in our church this week who, who is one of those people who just, she's aware of God's presence and, 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 and she just sees him working all around and, and nothing's insignificant because she sees the hand of God everywhere. 
That's a person who's learned to walk with God. Number six, they are obedient. The scripture is clear that we can't say we have fellowship with God and that we're walking with God so long as we are walking in sin. If you're maintaining a lie, you're not walking with God. If you're holding a grudge, you're not walking with God. If you're sleeping with somebody who's not your spouse of the opposite sex, you're not walking with God. You see, we can't claim to have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness. And those who are walking with God, when they discover themselves in darkness, as they invariably do, they immediately confess. And they share with God, I've sinned. I'm sorry. I'm turning back. I'm walking your way again. I'm no longer walking away. I'm walking back towards you. And they find a father who is always willing to receive them and bestow on them a robe and a ring with great joy. Number seven, they have one master. People who walk with God have one master that they are trying to please and only one. People who walk with God are not man pleasers because you can't be and walk with him. They're not people out for fame. They're not out for fortune. They're not out for success. They're not out for any other thing except to please him, the Lord, their master. Number eight, they have a listening ear. People who walk with God approach the word listening for the voice of God to come through it. They sit with others around the word listening for the voice of God to speak. They go into prayer not only to share their own heart, but listening for God's voice to lead and direct them according to the word. They have a listening ear. His sheep know his voice. And they listen for it. Number nine, they have a broken heart. People who walk with God are increasingly aware of the brokenness of the world around them and the brokenness of their own selves. And they have what the scripture calls a broken and contrite spirit. And yet, number 10, they have a joyful hope. In the midst of confronting their own brokenness in the ways that they're not yet what they long to be, in the midst of seeing the world and all of its ugliness, they do not despair. They're not discouraged. But as Jason was sharing earlier, we have this hope. We, we, we celebrate the fact that Jesus is on the throne. We, we believe at the deepest core of our being that the one whom we are walking with will make all things right, that he will right every wrong, that he will change every... He's going to renew the heavens and the earth. He's going to implement the vision that was established long before creation. They have this hope. So brothers and sisters, are you walking with God? And the answer is no. <laughs> Not like I should be. <laughs> not like the scripture invites me to. Not in the way that, that I'm invited to. Not even like Enoch was. But you know what the good news is? We know somebody who did. Who did walk with God this way. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus was always reconciled to God. There was never fellowship broken. Jesus was always trusting his father. Jesus was always surrendered to the father's will. Jesus was always obedient. He was always listening. He was always walking with this broken heart, a man of sorrows, and yet with this joyful hope and anticipation, knowing that in the end all would be right. And Jesus walked with God, not for himself, but for us. And Jesus went to the cross as a man guilty of sinning against God, like one who didn't walk with God, so that we who didn't walk with him could actually walk with him by faith. As imperfectly as we do it, as much as we stumble and fall along the way through Jesus, every one of us now is invited into this kind of walk with our God starting today, to share the kind of intimacy and communion and fellowship that Jesus and the Father had, we get to share. And that's what communion's about. It's about fellowship with our Father through the broken body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's because of what he did that we get to walk with God today and every day, even in spite of the fact that we continue to fall and sin and stumble. And all of us come here today as stumbling people. But the table reminds us that because of what Jesus has accomplished, God continued to invite us. You want to take a walk? 
You want to take a walk with me? I hope you hear his invitation this morning and that through faith in Jesus and and as your faith is strengthened by the bread and the cup, that you'll say yes and join him in that today. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we delight to walk with you. We don't always delight in it like we should because we don't always see so clearly what it is you've invited us into and yet you've invited us to share intimacy and communion and fellowship, to know your heart, not as slaves or servants, but as sons as friends. And Lord, we thank you for this gift given to us through the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us now to taste it, to touch the promise and to grasp it by faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.